connected devices. Uh, we know that at the moment, as we sit here today, there are more connected devices than there are people in the world. I think in 2010, there was 12 and a half billion connected things. Uh, Cisco predicts that in 2015, there will be, I think it's uh, 25 billion things connected to the internet. And in 2020, there'll be 50 billion things connected to the internet. So that gives us something of a sort of insight into what the future looks like and gives us an opportunity to think, to, to think together about what that might mean. So computers and phones we've talked about today have kind of been driving that uh, sort of architecture and that connectivity, but obviously within the wearable futures context, we can look at things in a much more physical and much more material cultures based way. There are lots of people in this ecosystem thinking about what con connected futures might mean, and particularly about what the 2020 landscape looks like. And I just want, if we have, do we have sound? Let's try. I want to take a little look at, oh, hello, that's moving, that's exciting. I want to have a little look about what Microsoft think 2020 might be. This is a design fiction that they put together to, to start to think about what Microsoft's contribution to the future would be. Welcome to Johannesburg International Airport. Please approach the road to create your pickup zone. take it down there because I realize we're running to time but that is one vision of the future um, it's not that it's a bad one but it's a bad one um, it's a lot of screens and the thing that makes me tell you that it's a bad one is because nobody talked to anyone else nobody touched anyone else uh, nobody giggled nobody uh, got lost nobody had a happy accident nobody uh, discovered anything by coincidence um, those are very, very human experiences and they're part of what make us enjoy our lives and enjoy the places that we live. So whilst screens obviously play a big, a big, big part in our future and we're all kind of developing new gestural interfaces for ourselves and for our technologies, there's more to life than that, I would suggest, um, which is one of the reasons why we set up the place where I live, and that's the Pervasive Media Studio within Watershed. Um, not to say that that shouldn't happen, but that to be, we can perhaps together provide some sort of a counterpoint, to provide some different thinking about what digital futures might look like. So within the Pervasive Media Studio, we have the opportunity to work with a network of extraordinary people from all sorts of different backgrounds. There's about 150 of us that broadly come from creative backgrounds, from technology backgrounds, and from academic backgrounds. And included in that are sort of scientists and uh, dancers and theater performers and magicians and space scientists and choreographers and tinkerers and hackers. We, we're a really permissive community of people who are interested in trying things and in doing things differently and in learning together about what that might mean. So my job really, um, to come back to my invisible strings metaphor, is to try and create those conditions for the connections to happen. If I can give you one example of how that sometimes happens in the studio, we've recently been working on a project called Dance from Spectroscopy. 
which is sort of what happens when you allow a scientist to name a project. It's an impossible thing for anyone to say except for the practiced amongst us. But Dance from Spectroscopy started out um, with an amazing professor called David Glowacki, who is one of the leading thinkers in quantum chemistry. He has been revolutionizing the, the research that's been going on into, into the hidden fields of molecular particle physics. And he knows everything there is to know about the way that things behave on the nano level. He also is friends with lots of artists and has no way of explaining to them what he does for a living. He's a kind of a surfer guy, he's a creative guy, he's got a master's in cultural theory, he's a polymath. And being in the studio connected him to a choreographer and a troupe of dancers, to a sound designer, to a musician, to a computer scientist, and they created a cohort within themselves to create something called Dance from Spectroscopy, which really broadly is a immersive environment which allows you to be visualized as an energy field. So you're mapped with an, an array of connect sensors in a given space, and your avatar is projected onto the screen or screens around and above you giving you an energy field in the way that you already do, but visualizing around you those hidden particles that already exist in the nanosphere and giving you the opportunity to interact with them in real time according to the very real science behind quantum chemistry. So you can move in a space, you can embody your own self, and you can interact with that tiny nanochemical world, and in doing so, understand a little bit more about the chemistry behind it, or just enjoy being in your body and moving freely. It's a really beautiful piece of work, and it's what happens when you allow people to operate on the same playing field. Nobody had hierarchy in that environment, although I'm sure there'll be those that would disagree with me in that, uh, in that collaboration. But it was an opportunity for everybody to have an equal say in what was made, and the results are now being um, exhibited in those 360 domes that we saw earlier and are traveling around Europe at the moment on tour in, in the way that theatre tours. Science is being toured as theatre. Uh, and the... Um, the Society, Royal Society for Chemistry are creating a number of interactive digital tools that will allow young people to use it as a learning environment. So it's dance, it's science, it's education, it's all those things. We disrupt ourselves regularly with residents, and some of you who were in here earlier will have met one of my um, recent most marvellous residents, Kieran Kirkland, who is one of two magicians in residence that we decided to, uh, to invite into the studio. For us... Ideas are born of connection and collaboration, and we work quite closely with the University of Bristol's Interaction and Graphics group, who do some extraordinary things with physical computing. And between us, we figured out that um, technology is often viewed as magic, and magic is often imbued with technology. And so what can we do when we embed magicians, practicing magicians, into a creative technologies environment, give them free run of the place and allow them to work with interesting people. And what we sort of thought we were doing was um, leveraging tech to make wizzy new tricks and illusions and misdirections and wouldn't it all be sort of Paul Daniels magic kit. Um, what we didn't know was that actually uh, technologists have much to learn from magicians and that actually the interesting things, as Kieran was saying, come out of the narratives that you tell with technology, the context that you place technologies in, and the creative interfaces uh, that you can kind of imagine and uh, communicate through magical practice. So, <laughs> uh, I like an animated GIF, you might spot that. Um, so part of what we do and um, part of creating those conditions for serendipitous connection is by trying things that you don't know the answers to, about identifying some things that are of interest and just sort of hooking them together and seeing what happens. Um, one of the most recent uh, times that we experimented with that was uh, we were asked to co-program something called Bristol Proms, which um, goes back to the sort of 1800s uh, and was a classic sort of proms season with the Bristol Old Vic. Um, they wanted to do things differently, and of course, so do we. So we thought we would try and run a classical music hack. That seems reasonable. Um, so we invited the Sarconi Quartet, who are a classic cha chamber music quartet, to host a two-day hack with designers, with technicians, with coders, with programmers, um, with a range of wonderful people who create work in the creative technology sphere. We knew that the instruments that they had were sort of 200 years old and that they couldn't be touched and that they were insured for millions of pounds. And we knew that the music that they played hadn't really changed much since the 1840s. So the idea of hacking a quartet was a challenging one, but kind of tricksy enough that we thought we would have a crack at it. Um, 
there were sort of 20 hacks that emerged in two days. It was extremely prolific. Uh, but just to give you a little flavor of some of the things that people did, um, Heidi Hinder, who you can hear from, I believe, tomorrow, who will be speaking on one of the panels, uh, placed a lipstick can within one of the performer's instruments to give you this amazing sort of architectural inside view of the instrument as it was being played. And the light that diffuses through those F shapes is extraordinary. So you can have a real-time viewing experience of inside the instruments. Liam from New Design, who's one of our um, resident companies, basically put a pressure sensor on a bow, very simple, quick hack, but by hooking that up so that the MIDI signal from that pressure sensor went through various different bits of software, the performers were able to use their bow as an effects pedal. So they could use the bow, and just by pressing their thumb more strongly or less strongly on the bow, they could modulate the sound, they could create pitch shift, they could create echo, they could make loops, they could effectively create electronic music in situ whilst playing a classical instrument. I shall play the song of my people. So this is <laughs> this is um, this is uh, another animated GIF. It's also a slightly sort of clumsy way of, of going from one to another because one of the things that we learn in hacks, and as Kira mentioned earlier, we also did a, a magical hack, and it's a really fertile place to try things. Um, is that developments in hardware and software are making it increasingly quick and easy to do these kind of rapid fire, extraordinary projects, and they can be really vitalizing and really interesting. What they struggle to do in that kind of quick context is consider things like form, consider things like materiality, consider what the sort of the central and tactile interfaces are. So one of the things that we're just about to do is start something which we call Sandbox, which is our sort of R&D model. And we'll be drawing together six brand new teams of academics and creative practitioners in the spring. They're currently applying, the deadline is Friday to think together with us and to do some live projects, some real prototypes, some real demos about what material culture means for the Internet of Things. We're really interested in what those human interfaces are for connected objects, for objects that have some relationship with the Internet, but particularly looking at what those human experiences are. So some of the things that have been inspiring us in that space, and there are plenty, um, are things like GlowCap. Has anyone come across GlowCap before? Tiny bit of nodding, not so much. So Glowcap is a commercial product already in the market. Um, it takes an existing form, the pill bottle, which is very much a part of many people's lives, and it addresses a real life problem, which is that if you have complex medication or you perhaps have difficulty um, with your own uh, scheduling for medication, the cap knows what you're supposed to have. It knows what your prescription is. It knows when you're supposed to have it. And so at the moment at which uh, you're, you're due to take your medication, the cap will subtly glow. There's also a, a plug-in, which is the thing to the left of it, um, which you can just have in your living room that will glow subtly. So it's not invasive, it's not nagging, it's just a subtle reminder that there's a part of your daily life that's waiting for you. Uh, because it's networked, it also has the potential to um, send uh, notifications to your pharmacy to say you're running out, you're going to need some more, or to your doctor to say that you've missed a dose or to a family member. So it uses the form of the existing product but augments it and enhances it in a way that mobilizes those kind of connections that we can have through the Internet of Things. This is a project called Starlight that I'm just going to let you see rather than tell you about.
So it's very much a contrasting project to the previous one, but it's still very much inspiring us in the, in the object space. For me, it's a way of um, using things like open data, which we hear so much about, and big data, and all of those kind of big, things that sort of feel a bit amorphous and a little bit um, depersonalized, and bringing it into the physical space, creating kind of ambient relationships with information, such as that kind of incredible um, space exploration, and translating that into something that feels uh, textured and that feels delicate and that feels special in our everyday environment. Um, in a way, it's a different way of doing data visualization rather than making kind of lots of diagrams and, and pretty pictures. If you can do data visualization through physical objects, then that gives us a whole new set of affordances and a whole new set of experiences that, that feel um, more personal somehow. So the final objects reference that I'd like to share with you is one of my favorite. It's, um, it's called hashtag unravel. And I would encourage you to use that because it will, it will do something somewhere. Um, it's by an organization called Found. And they uh, created this for an installation uh, in a gallery in Dundee. The, um, the work itself invites you to choose from a series of vinyl records and to place that record onto the deck that you can see in the middle there. One of the lovely things that will happen when you drop the pin is that the instrumentation around you will recognize that that's the music that's being played and will effectively play. So the, the percussion instruments around are automata and they will strike up a, a song and the narrative will start and the owner of the records has a narrative voice on those records so will start to tell you a story. They're stories from his life, and they tell you a little bit about him and the music that he loves. But the thing that changes as you hear the story is that the truth of it will alter, and the truth of it will alter according to various contextual factors. So this is what happens with an invisible string attached. The story that you hear will depend on things like the time of day that it is, how warm it is outside, and critically, what people are saying about that project online. So if somebody's recently said, hashtag unravel, what a bag of balls, the story will become a bit self-conscious and a bit worried about itself and will collapse into a fit of blubbering, potentially. If what people are saying online is that Unravel is wonderful and they really enjoyed it and it was the most inspiring Internet of Things project that they've ever seen and, and the gallery was warm and it was nice, then the project will become more inspired. So it's a sort of a self-aware connection to the Internet that informs the way that performance is delivered in real time. If that didn't make any sense, do just come and quiz me about it afterwards. It's quite complicated, but beautiful nonetheless. So if, um, so if a string quartet is a slightly literal interpretation of a string and Internet of Things have strings to the Internet, um, I want to just take a minute to think about cities as connected environments. Um, in my line of work, we come across an awful lot of... Um, intelligent debate about smart cities and what new technologies afford cities in terms of connectivity. Uh, there are fantastic projects going on inside all the big kind of tech houses looking at how we can kind of embed sensor systems in the cities and have more kind of efficient travel controls and how we can make the bins more bin-like, um, which is fine. And again, it's fine. But it comes down to what's the future city that we want to live in? What is it that makes this city that you live in or the city that you live in elsewhere particular? And why do you live there? What is it about that city that feels special to you or hideous to you or changes on a daily basis? What is it that makes that specific? Um, I think we're seeing around the world now a number of particularly arts-driven projects that are thinking about cities and particularly technology in cities in ways that kind of goes past that slightly cold, slightly um, efficiency-driven model. So one of the, um, the earliest examples that inspired me was um, a project called Noir Verts, which was launched in Helsinki uh, in response to this big physical challenge that they have. They have a giant power station in the middle of the city, and it's a sort of a constant reminder of the, the polluting behavior of the citizens. It can be a very negative influence. So rather than putting up lots of posters saying, switch off your toasters, you're killing us, an artistic installation went in that involved projecting the energy use of the city in real time onto the plume of smoke. So this green cloud just represents quietly the energy use of the city at that time. It gave people a sense of their own agency in the city and it gave people a sense that what they were doing had that impact. That was a clear uh, string to be drawn between the two things. And what happened over time in the six weeks that the project ran was that cloud started to shrink. 
So not through nagging, but just through sort of subtle provocation, behaviours started to change a little bit, and the city suddenly had this big badge of honour for itself, that it was actually diminishing its energy supply rather than being a kind of a pollutant. In really small ways, people are finding uh, sort of playful ways to hack their cities. So this was a student project in Germany where a group of students just put a game on a traffic light. So it was a notorious traffic light, took forever for the lights to change. It was really, really slow, really dull. So while you're waiting, you could just play a game of Pong with the person on the other side of the streets. And the red would just tip down to tell you how much time you had, and you had that much time to beat them. So you'd just play a little game, and there's lovely uh, footage online, if you care to see it, of people playing together and just sort of high-fiving as they cross the street. Yes! Just small connections to the people that you live with and small ways of making your everyday commute a little more joyful and a little, little more unusual. Um, I'm from Bristol, so uh, you'll excuse me if I'm a slight sort of uh, Banksy fanboy, but the, um, you may have seen recently... Ooh, sound. Um, Banksy sort of declared himself artist-in-residence in New York, and uh, this was one of his city hacks. You can have the sound back if you like. Not for everyone, it turned out. So, so again, you, you could do sort of um, civic nagging. You could say, pay attention to where your food comes from. Or you could say, this is what the meatpacking district used to be. Or you could stuff a meatpacking van full of um, kind of Muppet-style animatronic creatures and scoot around the city. These are choices that you have when you decide how to uh, participate in your city and, and the way that you mobilize uh, the technology and the creativity that you have. So looking at all of these inspiring things and going, well, the world seems to be uh, a little more playful than perhaps we gave it credit for. Um, we had to think to ourselves, what, what are we going to do to, uh, to kind of walk that walk? What are we going to do to take part in this? How can we kind of push this forward a little bit? Um, so we came up with this notion of the playable city, a city as a playable space, a place that is available for participation, that is changeable, that is malleable, and that you can give the people who live there, some sense of their own agency within the city. Um, it was a sort of provocation to, uh, to the smart city lobbyists and an interesting take on, on what we already were, were looking at. So we launched an award last year called the Playable City Award. We launched an international um, competition in appealing to artists and creative practitioners from anywhere around the world to pitch us something really wonderful, something that was uh, kind of burning within them to start exploring this idea of the city as a playable space. We were really delighted. We had about 100 applicants from 24 different countries. Um, I, I was going to tell you lots about it, but something to do with time pressure and also the fact that one of the creators of the winning project is on the panel next means that I'm going to just slightly tease you with it. Um, some of you may have come across this project. It was called Hello Lamppost. Did anybody... Shall I just tell you a little bit about it? So Hello Lamppost uh, was a project realised by a London-based studio called Pan Studio, who some of you may know an amazing creative technologist called Tom Armitage, who is on the following panel, so do come and see him, and an amazing experienced designer called Georgi Gallic. And what they did was they took the city and looked at it as a playable infrastructure. They didn't want to stuff it full of sensors. They didn't want to bring in lots of new technology. They wanted to look at the city itself and the infrastructure that was already there as the thing that was playable. So, for example, post boxes, all of them, and you can check, have codes on them. They will say something that looks a little bit like the postcode. Lamp posts, likewise, often have codes on them, as do bins, as do benches. City infrastructure is kind of codified, but it's not for you. It's for the repair teams, it's for the councils, it's for those people that need to identify what is where. Except for in this case, when suddenly it was for you. 
And I, I will try and let Tom tell you a bit more about it. But broadly, it, will, it was mobilizing a super lo-fi technology, which you have, your parents have, and that's SMS. This was not a smartphone initiative. This was not an, an app. This was about using super low-tech stuff like SMS to start a conversation with the city's ob objects and the city's furniture. So you could walk up to a post box in Bristol over the summer this year and say, hello, post box, BS4632, how's it going? It would ask you a question. It would tell you perhaps the story of the person that was there before, and it would know a little bit about what it was, and it would ask you questions about who you were. It was a really, really subtle, charming, beautiful way of starting to invite you to look at your city in a different way, to uh, embrace a certain amount of um, silliness and joyfulness, and to start to hear the stories of the people that were around the city before you. So in talking to these objects, you would unlock the stories of the people who spoke to it last. I think... So as not to get myself in trouble, that's all I'm going to tell you about that one, but I would uh, encourage you to have a look. So what are we doing next? So Playable City Awards will relaunch again in January. Um, we really would love, and I really would love, to, um, to see applications from people who have very different ways of looking at Playable Cities. We've tried Hello Lamp Post, it was extraordinary. We've tried various other things uh, through working in different contexts. I really want to know what you think a Playable City would be. Oh, look at that. He's doing this at me. Ace. So, <laughs> so I would very much encourage you to look at the call when it comes out. Um, we're also hosting a conference in May, so you can save that date. I will, um, I'm going to do this, but I'm just going to bring it back to wearables because of, because of you and because of what we're doing today. So uh, that's, that's my wearables gift. So, <laughs> um, so for me, I think what this means for wearables uh, is what we can learn from those kind of connections between communities, connections between objects, and connections between cities. What I really mean is um, what is the sort of the functionality of what we can do? What does functionality now dictate form? Or does the form dictate functionality? Does the technology that we can play with allow us an opportunity to subvert the form? I realize whilst there's Spider-Man spitting, you can't pay attention to me, so I'm going to just skip. So, <laughs> so for me, I would really challenge you today to think about what do you mean by wearables and what are the opportunities that you have to create those kinds of culturally rich, social, shared and connected experiences that mobilize some of those technologies or maybe don't, but consider the form, consider the experience and consider what's next for what you do because you people have inspired me today and I'm really excited to see what you do next. So let's not just keep making Geordie LaForge visors and rubber bands. Let's make something extraordinary. Thank you.